So I'm here with Brian Long, CEO of Attentive Mobile. Brian is one of the best operating CEOs that I know. So first of all, Brian, thank you for being here. And Brian does a few things uniquely that are phenomenal and best of class. Brian, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about those so you can share those with the world and other people can take advantage of the discoveries that you've made. You've shared with me that one of the big successes that you've had is templatizing your one-on-one -on -one management system so you give clear agendas for each of your managers to follow and putting that in software so it's really easy to do as opposed to sort of giving them training and then letting them figure it out on their own or not being sure if they're using you give them a template plus software i'd love to know what difference that has made for you the eureka moment for us was we look at just the, the sheer amount of one-on-one -on -one meetings we we're having at the company and it was far and away the largest time spent across the company on any on any individual thing. And then you say, okay, well, what's happening in these meetings? Are they effective? They were not effective to sometimes just a waste of time. It was this waste of time that parties felt like they had to keep doing to like keep up appearances and show they cared. I think if you, you got down to the core of why it was a waste of time, it was that you most of these just kind of turned into no agenda meetings, which, you know, is a really bad thing to do. And it, it just kind of devolves into talking in circles and catching up and whatever, which yeah, I'm not going to say that has no value at all, but it could be much higher leverage. And then in tr rolling it out, it sounds like you simply took a template that was working well for you and your one-on-ones and simply put it into Lattice and then rolled Lattice out to the entire company. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, Lattice recognize this because they have a template for one-on-ones, right? So that they might allow you to, to change. What we did was we we used some of the techniques that you've set up in, in, in coaching and brought them to this sort of one-on-one -on -one framework throughout the company. You know, starting with the good, then digging into issues and sometimes into goals as well, and then going into topics and then having time for feedback at the end. It also can be helpful when you're when you're having an issue with someone or there's a problem on a team, whatever, and you say, Okay, well, let's let's go to their one-on-ones. You know, what, what what's the issues they're talking about? What's the feedback you're giving? And if you go and you say, well, the manager isn't using the templates. The manager isn't using the tools. The manager isn't like filling this stuff out. You say, well, you know, then the manager needs to to step up and 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 help this employee because, you know, is it the employee's problem or is it the manager's problem? All of my directs use the lattice, and we use it every month because I do my I like. 12 or 13 directs. So we, we, we use it every month and it's prepared and the good, the issues, the bad, everyone's on it. And it's a really nice cadence. What's been the tangible benefit of that other than it's easy to remember and you can, in those situations when there's a performance issue, you can see, you know, where's the responsibility and which side. Have there been any other uplifts? Because there's a pain in, involved. I mean, I remember when you first installed this, there was nearly a, a company-wide riot. Some managers like to have this idea that it's just kind of a shoot the shit session and they didn't like they kind of bucked at the idea of there being an agenda and my response to that is like look if you want to shoot the shit that's fine but recognize that there are things that should be an agenda and it's nice to have a template to go to right so i i think just telling them would you rather have no template or a template most people are like well it's nice to have something to start from you're not, you're not going to make them do exactly the way you said it it's a little different per department it's a little different per role so you need to be a little flexible on those things that's what we learned over time we also really focused it down to its core which is what's the good what's the biggest issue that you have what are any other topics and what's the feedback, right? So that really consolidates it down to an easily digestible packet that really you can do in 30 minutes if you have to, right? I prefer to do it a minimum of an hour, but you could get through that material in 30 minutes if you had to. In terms of like the, the, what the greatest value came from, I think the good has a lot of value because it, it does call out a lot of cases. People are like, I don't feel appreciated. Being able to meet with your manager and call out the good helps that appreciation factor, particularly in a remote workforce. And then secondly, spending time on the biggest issue, different levels of operating pieces in the company, but across departments, there's going to be across all roles, there's going to be one issue and being able to focus on that issue, it's going to be pretty high leverage. So next is turning meetings into working sessions. You've made it so that instead of it being all verbal so that the two or three people who are the most verbal, they're the only ones we hear from. Instead, whenever you have a topic, you ask everyone in the meeting to take two to three minutes write down their thoughts, and then we can see everybody's thoughts equally. And you do that on pretty much every agenda item throughout the meeting. 
Is that right? Have I got that right? And and what's the benefit? What's been the benefit of that? Looking at just just meetings in general. Let's say you take your average meeting with like five or six people in it. Hopefully not more than that. That's like a working type meeting, not just like a communication session. Anything over five or six people, it's probably just one way communication. To everyone. It's a really expensive thing to have those six people there working on something live, but it turns into just one or two people debating something. Who usually the most outspoken like to talk people and the other five people saying, eh, I'm just going to like check my email, not pay attention, do other stuff, sort of half be here, whatever. And you miss a big opportunity to hear from everyone in that meeting and get great ideas from everyone in that meeting. So as you said, what if we use meetings as more working sessions, which is very funny because what is a meeting if not a working session? But like, it's not, right? It turns into just two people talking about God knows what and debating something, right? Let's use an example. I've got a problem right? And my problem is I'm having trouble recruiting for a particular role. Other six people on this, think about your most recent hires. What do you think I should do to help recruit for this role better? Take the next two or three minutes to write down all your career ideas and then paste them into the document. And then I'll run through those ideas. And I might ask some clarifying questions and get a list of potential things I can do to solve this problem. I, I think that this is high leverage for a couple of reasons. One, you get input from everyone in the room. In this case, the question I'm asking, sure, it's a problem I have, but it's a problem that all managers have. And everyone can in that room say, you know, that's an interesting idea that person is Kate Bryant. I'm going to use that on my next role too. Instead of, you know, just saying, hey, I'm having trouble with this thing. And one other person talks for 10 minutes about how they solve the problem. You only heard from one person right? Instead of hearing from the whole room, having it well documented, having something you can go back to. Two, I think that the beauty of remote work is that we can all have a shared doc we're all working in, in real time. And we can go back to that doc and, and get ideas and use it. We have a rolling document, all of this exists. In. I go back to that document all the time to just pull out stuff that we were talking about and, and inject it into my workflow. I love it. It's basically turning conversations into written conversations so that more people can participate at the same time. We do it async, as I think you shared with me before, that some people just don't do it. A lot of people just don't do it. I think that for async, not only do sometimes people not do it and they need to be nudged to do it, they rush through it because it's just a thing that sort of check off the checklist. It doesn't have a certain marked amount of time to do it in, so they're just going to get through it as quick as they can and move on to the next thing. They're also not in the right mental frame to kind of see the problem and hear the problem to really be focused on the problem and, and get clarifying questions. You see other people's ideas and you say, that's a good idea. Let me add to that idea. It's easier to riff off of others' ideas than just kind of giving async feedback. I, I really don't like async comments in Google Docs, for instance. There's some cases where they're useful, but generally I don't like them because it's like hard to get follow-up questions. It's stuff you've heard 10 times. It's not really easy to usually work and later add content to. You just end up with these Google Docs that have all these comments in them and you're like, what do I do with this? So I, I, I think it's more helpful to work in real time on it. Fantastic. I love it. I'm going to just keep going because you've done so many things that are innovative that the world should know about. I'm going to jump to one, Brian, that's a little bit more personal. You and your wife just had a child in this past year. And many CEOs who have children, they run right into a wall. They, they have a newborn. That, frankly, they're completely unprepared for it. it. It hits them like a ton of bricks. And then they realize, oh my gosh, now I have parenting duties that can take me away at any moment oftentimes at the least opportune moment and for long periods of time, even if it's not during the work day, I don't get the ability to restore at night. And so I'm, I'm a mess during the day. And you probably better than anyone else I know have figured out how to not let that happen to you, how to take care of parenting in a way that still allows you to be fully present and restored in your role as CEO. Can you please tell us your secret? just asking people for ideas and listing out those ideas and working off those ideas. Our approach to preparation for having a kid was like that. So talking to other people who had similar roles, similar situations, whatever, and just asking them, what are the things you did? What are the things you liked that you did? What are the mistakes? What are the things you wish you redid? And just getting that list of things we should be doing. It's real work, right? I mean, we, we interviewed a lot of people for, you know, sort of nanny help, 
I did like 20 different interviews, had an extensive amount of reference calls and things like that that we did to find the right person. Also find a backup person. So if there was ever an issue, we could go to the backup person. The fact is it's time, it's hard work, but if you do it, the leverage there is incredible. I have seen other folks that didn't do as much of that work up front. And as a result, you know, it just got harder because once they kind of needed it and get desperate, it's just like hiring in general. When you start to get desperate for a hire, you pull the trigger on a hire that in retrospect, you probably wouldn't have hired if you weren't like desperate to make that hire. And it ends up creating at times more trouble than it than it helped. I think the more that you can do this and spend the time on it ahead of time and get it right, ensures that you're gonna have a better outcome ultimately. So it's just it's just like that, that type of hiring and staffing up. This is a 24 seven role. And it's just like hiring up for a customer support desk. You're gonna hire up not only someone for every shift, but you're also gonna make sure that there's backups. You wouldn't hire one person to operate a customer support desk. You wouldn't put it all on one person to parent a child and that having a full team ready to go and maybe even over hiring is what I'm hearing you say. The mistake here is not to over hire, the mistake is to under hire because once you under hire, then you're desperate and then you end up having to just take whoever's available, which isn't gonna be the best person. I don't think I've ever talked to someone who says that they have over hired. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. I love it. Awesome. Lastly, Brian, you had also have done a, a unique thing in hiring. Every board that I know of gives the same advice over and over again. Take whatever exec team that you brought to the party and hire above them. Now that you're this billion dollar, $5 billion, $10 billion company, you can now go out and get rock star this, rock star that, rock star the other. Every single board says this. This is just like, just the pat advice. And I think it misses the point that the people that brought you to the dance have a lot of institutional knowledge. And what is it that that outside person can, can bring you? And why can't you teach your team how to have those things and you have done two things. You've one stuck with the people who, who came with you. And you, when you have hired from the outside, you haven't hired the biggest names. You've hired the people who are still hungry, very high potential, but still wanting to succeed. So again, I think you've done this better than anyone I know. Was this conscious? And if so, what was your thought process? And then how do you do it? And by the way, you had to resist some serious pressure, I'm thinking from your board because I know every board gives us advice. Often I think the, the popular wisdom is, is risk minimization, which is let's hire someone who has done X before because there is less of a risk of them messing X up because they've done it before and therefore they will be capable of doing it again. That logic misses for a couple different things. A, are you going to hire someone who indeed did do it well before and is great who wants to come work for you? In my experience, hiring those great people are really hard because most great people, if you're great, you're listening to this, you're great. Do you want to go work for a stranger? <laughs> like, like, like do, are you, are you going to respond to some random executive recruiter and go work for a stranger? And that's what you want to do at your career, at this point in your career, when you're, you've done it before and you're great. Is that what you're going to do next? I don't think a lot of people who are great who have seen that type of success want to go work for strangers in their next gig by going through an executive headhunter. That's just not what most great folks want to do. They want to go to trusted folks that at best is like a friend of a friend intro to get there. So I think that's that's number one, just recognize what do great people want to do. And if you're listening to this, maybe you're great and you, you can understand that mindset, right? So first off, I think just acknowledge a little bit of the fallacy that exists within the assumption that you're gonna find great people through an executive recruiter who's gonna come. Two, there's a risk that you're gonna hire someone who was great when they worked at their last company eight years ago. But this world is changing a lot. Like, I think COVID has completely changed management. The things that worked in office three years ago no longer work remotely. The, I just, in this thing, we already talked about how the entire style of meetings and potentially even one-on-ones is totally different and works really well remotely but would be pretty weird in person, right? So management has changed completely. And it's someone who was good at that old style of management could not be someone that's good at the new. And they may be a lot less willing and a lot less coachable to adjust to the new. 
Well, you know what? It worked for me back in the day when I worked at X Place 10 years ago, and I'm just bringing that to this place now because that's what worked there, and I'm going to bring it here now. And I think that lack of coachability can be a big issue. You know, I'll, I'll ask people at the end of an interview, how do you think you did on a 1 to 10 scale? And if they answer an 8, that's kind of the borderline answer. Like, if they did really well and they answer an 8, I'm like, okay, that's kind of the borderline answer, but it's kind of a, a mark that's a negative, but it's a, but it's a borderline answer. Anything above an 8, no way I'm going to hire this person because anyone who comes out of an interview saying I got a 10, I'm the best, like they're not going to be coachable at all. So I, I do think that that coachability is a lot harder and it's not even me. Like it's not to say I know um, how to do their job better. It's coachability that we explain in that one-to-one -one system. It's someone just helping you solve your problems and changing your approach to things in order to be successful. You know, the basketball coach isn't a better basketball player than, than the player they, they coach, right? It's a third party being able to give honest feedback to try to help them to be better and better at their game. We're throwing out the door, going for the, he's done it three times before, she's done it three times before, we're gonna make that higher person. And trying to find people that are in this nether region, right? Because either A, you've got them already, which my advice is, yes, it can be nice to add someone who's a bit more experienced to your executive team because they can also help your less experienced team who have a lot of the institutional knowledge and a lot of the drive and all that stuff. Great, pair those two together, it can be really, really successful. B is how do we find, create additional new executives to add to the team, right? I think, Matt, a great thing you you say on this is like, it's hard to get that out of an interview. Show me historical performance. I, I do think saying historical performance and being able to have you someone tell you this this person is just an incredible, you know, X, yes, they're not as experienced. Yes, they haven't been doing as long, but wow, I would like love to work with this person again. They're just so incredible in X, Y, Z ways. I think when you hear that, that's what makes me most excited. That sort of back channel reference on someone that's that's really, really good like that and has that excitement to come to it. B, I like someone who's had some success, but not that much success because they're going to be really driven um, to, to get to the next level. Matt, we talked about this before, but I think there are people that like to work. And then there's people that like to work and still like to work once they become post-economic. <laughs> and that is an eve that's like if if there's uh, these numbers aren't real. Let's just say there's 10% of the population that really likes to work. Of that, maybe there's like 20 or 10% of that that once they become post-economic really wants to continue working. <laughs> and I think that finding those people is really hard. So, you know, it's much easier to find someone who's in that first group, likes to work, driven, but isn't post-economic yet. Easier to get them um, than it is to get the latter. Makes total sense. Brian, that was it. That's all I had. Thank you. You're awesome. <laughs>